I'm Chris Thomas. Um, I'm here at the Abbey Road Institute in Paris and uh, here to have a chat with the students. Very, very early on, uh, I was fascinated by record production. Um, I think uh, when I first heard Buddy Holly's records and realised that he had a lot to do with making his own records, there was something about that. Uh, there was something about the way echoes used on a record so that you're actually painting a picture, you're not actually recording a performance. It's not like if you get a jazz trio or something like that and you record it faithfully or a string quartet. You're actually, you know, you're manipulating stuff and you're, 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 you're changing it and painting with it. And so that's what really fascinated me. Because I think each producer works in a different way. I very much wanted to be along the lines of, uh, of something like Spectre, where I really managed to take over and do something. Some people, you know, engineers for instance, become collaborative on, on the record, so they kind of share production credits quite often with people. Actually, the, that's a weird thing, when you say, if you type my name into the internet, it shows record producer. Now, I mean, just recently, it says Abbey Road Engineer or something, I mean, or Air Studios Engineer. And I went like, where's this all gone wrong? I don't know, I mean, because I was never an engineer. Um, yeah, I was always focused on the music. However, I did have to learn all this stuff because whenever I've made a record, I've always mixed it. So you start to know how it all works. Well, effectively what you learn is you learn how things sound. So I used to work for Air, for Air London, which was a production company, which is George Martin, is Ron Richards, who produced all the Hollies hits, uh, John Burgess, who did people like, oh, what did he do now? I think he did Matt Munro as well. George Martin also did Matt Munro. Uh, Peter Sullivan, who produced Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck. So these four guys came together and formed a kind of cooperative. And that's where I started. That, they were the people that gave me the sort of a roof or a home rather to, to work under. And I, I just used to go down to sessions and watch what they were doing. And then they opened up Air Studios. I think the most difficult part is going from recording to mixing because when you're recording you're sort of playing with stuff it's like a kid sort of you know you just sort of throw stuff against the wall and see you know where where you, what are you going to do with it so you're playing i mean obviously the i mean when I, you're also paying serious attention to the construction of the song and stuff like that but when you come to mix it you always have to go from being subjective to objective and I think even, well actually that even applies to the recording process because when you're in the studio and you're doing stuff and you see how it is, then you've got to immediately, you've got to edit yourself and you've got to criticise yourself. So you've got to jump into this other person. So for me, that sort of jump was, was the, the heart, you know, that was the one where I needed the most discipline. Mixing for me was an extension of the recording because I always used to have like, I'd, I'd actually start building the song up right from the backing track. So if I ended up finding a particular echo on the drums or found a drum sound that I particularly, that would stay. And I would just keep building on it. I would never go back and then just put it all together again and start again. I'd build it slowly, bit by bit by bit by bit. Then um, mixes would then be, a, would do a recreation of that quite absolutely faithfully. Uh, of that um, and then try to enhance it but as a result of that quite often I've used monitor mixes as masters uh, on the first Pretenders album Precious and Tattoo Love Boys were both rough mixes quite often on an album I've ended up using a rough mix I think there's an, an Elton album a song called Blue Avenue that was a rough mix as well went back to the rough mix because it just had a feeling to it and then when you mentioned about going about mastering then the next thing what I, I would then first of all you have to assemble a, a running order which was quite a lot of fun because you could sort of seem to make shape out of these two sides it was much more difficult when it came to CDs because you know you, I, th I think we were all used to this sort of thing of like listening to something for 20 minutes. Then I'd find the best sounding, the track that just, that just sounded the best from the album. And I would then re-EQ it, I'd recompress it, maybe put a bit of echo on, treat it almost as, a, as though that mix is sort of, you know, is uh, a sort of stereo recording almost from going back to the oldest. And, and, and fiddle around with it and get that so I can actually, if I can get that sounding better, then that's basically, I say, first of all, that track's the best sounding one. Then I've fiddled around with it and hopefully made it even better. 
then I would get everything else on either side and work my way out so that they all sounded as good. Then the last thing you have to do then is listen to the white label of it. And by the time I've done that, I never want to hear this bloody record ever again in my life, and I never do. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm done. On a personal thing, I think um, when Paul kind of invited me to produce the Beatles, it was a bit of a stupid moment. That was uh, quite terrifying. Literally, when he said, well, you know, if you want to produce this, you can produce, and if you don't, you know, if you're no good, rather, you know where you can go. Um, I didn't say anything for about four hours. I just sat next to Ken Scott and they spoke to Ken. They completely ignored me. I just thought, I'm out in the gutter if I don't get this right. So I just decided to barge in there. So when they started recording again, <clears throat> somebody made a mistake and I interrupted them. George Martin would never interrupt them if they made a mistake. I just interrupted them. They said, what, what, what's going on? And I said, oh, I went, went a bit wrong going into the second chorus there. No, it didn't. It was like, oh. They all downed instruments and they walked up those stairs all the way up at number two in Abbey Road. And like each stair seemed to take about, and I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Because I thought, what happens if I've just imagined it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they came in, they heard the mistake and they got up and they went downstairs and they carried on recording again. And about an hour later, a similar thing happened. And this time they just started a new take. And at the end of the evening, the last one out was Paul, and I said, uh, I said, what, what happens about, what about tomorrow? What happens about tomorrow? He said, oh, come down if you want, and walked out, and I went, <laughs> he didn't say fuck off, I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> the material's the thing that drags me in, always. I mean, that can, you know, that can, that can change everything. If I think I can get my teeth into, into the songs. The most important thing is, well, the most important thing is the artist. That goes without question. Um, and above that, I would actually say that the, the writer's the most important because without the songs in it, you haven't got anything. But then the artist's the most important thing. But you've really, so you've got to bear that in mind that no matter what ideas you have in your own head, that they are more important than you are. But at the same time, you've got to follow your heart because you're working in a thing that's driven by passion. So you've got to follow what you feel. Um, and if it doesn't work out, then it, it, that kind of means that maybe it's not the right thing for you, you know. And I think that's another exciting thing about it, the fact that you can express yourself, you know, while working with everybody else. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the main thing, is to, to really be honest to your own feelings. Mm -hmm.